dear God, thank you so much for the beauty of music and the stirring sentiments that we feel when we put your word to music as we reach out to you and sing to you and as we, Father, just come before you and worship. We want to be like you. That's why we worship you. That's why we're here this morning, Father. And I ask that you would be with us as we run to your arms. Father, let us see those, that open arms of embrace from your side. Thank you, Father. And we come to you with broken lives. We're so messed up. We're just so messed up. But thank you for that grace that my brother Shane talked about. Thank you for that grace, Father, that draws us together this morning. We praise you in the name of Jesus and all the church said. Amen, Amen everybody. Have a seat. Tell you what let's do. Let's open up 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That's where we're going to be looking this morning, looking into the Word of God. We want the Word of God to just uh, infiltrate us and breathe through us and, and, uh, because we know that comes from God, right? That's our authoritative voice. So we're going to hear, we're going to look into 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 this morning. And while you're turning there, let me tell you about a guy named Frank. Frank Algaretti, right? And I doubt anybody here knows Frank. And if you've never met him, you can't meet him now because he died back in 2009. He was killed, actually. And uh, they found him out in a cornfield up in Iowa in the midst of the rubble of his plane. And everybody's story about Frank was he was an experienced pilot. He was very experienced. He'd been flying for years. And, and, and nobody could understand this because everybody said, here's their testimony. He's the most cautious. He is the safest pilot that anybody ever knew. And yet there he was laying in the middle of that Iowa cornfield surrounded by the rubble of his plane. What had happened? He'd run out of gas. That's it. He'd just run out of gas. And I don't care how experienced you are, when you run out of gas, you're, you're going down. Now, I don't know really how I'm going to end. Nobody here knows how we're going to check out of this world. Some of us may have a better idea than others, but I, don't, I, don't, I really don't know. But I'm pretty sure that I'm not going to wind up in a cornfield in the middle of the rubble of my plane. I'm not a pilot, for one thing. So I know I'm not going to die. I'm pretty sure that's not going to happen. But here's what I do know. I have run out of gas plenty of times. And I'm not talking about the petrol kind of gas. I'm talking about the energy and the passion for for ministry and for serving and for being with people. Sometimes I get kind of, you know, and, and I know, I know, maybe it's running through your mind, Paul's message there uh, in Galatians chapter 6, do not grow weary in well-doing because if you hang on, you're going to reap a harvest. If you don't quit, he says. And so I know that. I just know this too, when you start to run out of gas, you get in kind of a dangerous slope, right? And if you ever take your nose off the wheel, and you kind of, you're getting your breath, and it scabs over just a little bit. It's really, really hard to put your nose back down there again. You know what I'm saying? Amen? Do you hear what I'm saying? Amen. Yeah, yeah. So stick with it. Stay with it. Now, that's what we were talking about at the end of last week, right? Staying with the small stuff. That's what we talked about. And actually, that was part of a larger message about the nature of God, that God is the God of small things, and He's the God of... He's the God of small people. This God that created everything, this God that made the universe, this God that sustains all, revealed himself when he came to this earth as a human being. He revealed himself as a servant, a suffering servant, to put it in the language of Isaiah in the Old Testament. And he was the God of a towel. You remember we talked about that last week. We looked at John chapter 13 when he washes the feet of these disciples. And, we, and I begin to realize it's not the home run that he's looking for from me. It's not the, it, it, it's not the you know, get up to the plate and pitch a no-hitter every time you get up. He just wants me to hang on. He wants me to stay with The glory is in the ordinary things. And he washed the feet of these disciples. And you remember it was Peter that said, well, you're not. No, don't wash my feet. He had the idea that leaders, that lords, don't do things like that. You remember what Jesus said to him? Just, I'm reviewing just a little bit. He, you remember what he said to him? He said, if you don't accept this, you've missed the point. You've missed it. You've just missed it. And that's fitting. Because I see God as he's revealed in the Old Testament. He's the father to the fatherless, right? Yeah. He's the God of the widows and the orphans. And what that means is, well, I'll tell you one thing it means. it means. It means that if he cares for them, and they were the lowest on the totem pole, right, in terms of so social structure and all of that, the most helpless and the most hopeless you could be is be a widow or an orphan. Be a widow or an orphan, and if God cares for them, he cares for me. But that wasn't really our point last week. The point last week was the premium that God puts 
on us paying attention to the little things and little people. Puts a premium on that. Stick with it. Stick with it. Stick with it. Don't pull your nose off the wheel. Right? So we talked about what does it take to stick with it. Well, there's two ingredients to that perseverance pie. One of them is attitude. It is a negative return attitude. We let NASA inform us last week. You remember that? Every launch that NASA makes, whether it's a man flight or an unmanned flight, there's a point where mission control comes on and say, negative return, negative return. We've reached the point of, hey, don't turn me down, negative return. What that means is you can't go back, right? You're too far out, too far up. You can't go back to where you started from. It means that orbit is imminent. That's what Jesus calls us to. Luke 9 and verse 62, right? He states it kind of negatively, but he does that sometimes. He can be negative sometimes because he's to get a point across. And he says, nobody, after putting their hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for this business. You've got to get to that point of negative return where you're not, set, you're not sitting there analyzing, well, am I going to do this? Am I going to do If it's the Lord's will and God's calling you, you just do it, right? You just be about it. It's that attitude of negative return. And the second ingredient to perseverance by is love. Not so much that you love everybody you're dealing with and you love all those little foot washing things that you do. Sometimes it just gets really tedious and you do feel kind of weary about it at times. But the, what moves you on is you've experienced, you've tasted, you've tasted God's love for you. And you can't share what you've never experienced. Somehow or another we experience that incomprehensible Love of God for us, and then we're able to turn around and share that with the world around us. You know what? It, it's really not about, I know I've said this a lot, but let me just say it again right here. It's really not about knowing all those rules and getting all that. I'm not opposed to that. You understand what I'm saying? But we want to know Jesus. We want to know God. And I want to have the sense that in spite of me and all of my junk, and not that, not that my mistakes don't matter. They matter. I, I got all of that. But in spite of all of that, His grace reaches down and He loves me. <laughs> and He embraces me and He holds me. There's nothing in the... There's, I, you, I don't care where you could have gone this morning. You're not going to hear anything like that anywhere else that has the power to absolutely change your life. Absolutely change your life. Stick with it. Stick with it. Stay with it. Stay with the small stuff. We're continuing that thought this morning. Last week we were talking about staying with the stuff that we have to do, the things that are around us. This week Paul is going to speak to us right out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 about staying with the small stuff in terms of your personal life. All right. Now to really have an impact for what 1 Thessalonians 4 is all about, let's just have a little history lesson here, okay? Paul walks into Thessalonica in Acts chapter 17. Actually he limped. He probably limped into Thessalonica in, First Thessalon in, in, in Acts chapter 17 because he's on his second missionary journey, and it's been a tough journey. I mean, in the first missionary journey, he was stoned and left for dead. You think, man, it couldn't get much worse than that, right? But his second missionary journey was met with this, this struggle after struggle after struggle. It started off, his first major step, stop was in Philippi. And remember what happened in Philippi? He and Silas were skinned alive by lictor's rods because Paul had healed a little old girl possessed with the spirit of divination. I don't know exactly what that is, but I know what happened when he did that. He took away those old boys' meal ticket. By the way, if you think that people using the weakness and brokenness of other people for their own personal gain is a relatively new thing, no, oh, that's what was going on there. And he got beat up for it. From there, he went to Thessalonica, and Thessalonica had to be one of the toughest areas that he ever walked into. The Jews there were, they were just so resistant to anything other than what they'd always heard. You ever known anybody like that? <laughs> Here's what I've always heard. And so they just weren't going to get the message. And so after being there about six months, God led Paul away from Thessalonica. He left behind this beautiful body of Christ. But he went on to Thessalonica. Just to give you an idea how tough it was there, there were Jews that followed him from Thessalonica to his next stop, Berea. Man, listen, they, it was a rabid kind of thing. And so Paul is really concerned. How are you guys doing? How are you guys holding up under that kind of, uh, that kind of persecution? And look how he addresses them. And by the way, 1 Thessalonians is the first time that we have any record of that he communicates with that church since he had left. All right? So what he's going to be talking about are things that are really, really on his mind. And notice as he opens this up, flip back just for a second to chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Look at how he describes them. In verse 2 he says... Uh, 
We always thank God for all of you. Mentioning you in our prayers, we continually remember before our God and Father your three things. Work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a great church, right? They were, and by the way, they worked hard. You know why they worked? Why'd they work? Because they believed. Belief is powerful, regardless of the object, whatever you believe in. If you believe, you'll do incredibly, in the eyes of everybody else, ridiculous things. And they labored. That's just work on steroids, right? The Greek word, there's the same word that would be used to describe a woman in labor. They labored. Why? There it is, because of love. That love prompted labor. There's nothing like it in all the world. And this church endured. They stood firm. Why? Because of that hope, that confident expectation. Jesus Christ is coming back. Yeah. And that changes everything, right? That's a great church. But he wondered, how are you guys holding up? Chapter 2, he talks about his anguish. He talks about his broken heart, that he just wondered, what was going on with you guys? How are you guys holding up? He tells about all of that in the latter part of chapter 2. He finds out that everything is good. He's rejoicing. And then starting in chapter 4, he really begins to talk about what he wants to tell them about. Now think about this. He's been concerned about him. He's been all of this. Now he's going to talk about things that are really, really important. Now what that means is, is what you see in chapters 4 and 5, really, it's, I mean, it's critical. It's cutting edge stuff. And you know what he's saying to them basically? Particularly in the first 12 verses of chapter 4, he's saying, stay with it. Same thing we've been talking about last week, and here we are again this week. Stick with it. Don't you quit. In fact, if I was going to put a title over verses 1 through 12 of chapter 4, that's what it would be. Stay with the small stuff. Right? Now, if you have an NIV, it says, living to please God. That comes from verse 1. Let me tell you what it is. And by the way, sign me up for that course, right? I want to live to please God. But here's how you live to please God. You stick with it. You stick with it. Even those things that may seem prima facie, those things that may seem axiomatic, those things that may seem so foundational, you stick with it. Look at verse 1. Finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in the Lord in order to please God, as in fact you are living. You're doing it. You're doing it. Now we ask you and urge you, we beg and we plead in the Lord Jesus. To do this more and more. What does that mean? If he was speaking right now in the 21st century, he'd say, stick with it. I want you to stick with it, stick with it, stay with this stuff. It's the same phrase he uses. He repeats it again in verse 10. It's a phrase that kind of holds this whole little section together. Stay with it. Stay with it. Don't you quit. Don't you quit. You stay with the small stuff. This right here, the verse 12 verses of chapter 4, is Paul's Vince Lombardi speech to the Thessalonians. I think we've talked about Vince before, hadn't we? Everybody knows who Vince Lombardi is, right? And his, his football coach, he had two things that were really on his mind. One of them was teamwork. That's his big deal. And the other one was what? Coach, where are you? Where'd coach go? Where'd he go? What's the other thing? He's really, what was the other thing Vince Lombardi really big on? Oh, you're about basketball. You don't know anything about football, do you? Oh, what? Sit down. Sit down. <laughs> Fundamentals. Vince Lombardi was all about the fundamentals. And every day he would go in. Didn't we talk about this not too long ago? Every day he would go in the first day of the, each year. He got these million dollar players in there. These hot dogs. And he would walk in and he would say, this is a football. And God forbid you do what Mary just did. God forbid <laughs> that you'd have been in Vince's presence and laughed out loud. Because it would have been terrible for you. Fundamentals. Fundamentals. You got to know the fundamentals. He's saying, look, you've been doing this, verse 1. You've been doing this. You've been doing that. Now you do it more and more. He's talking about paying attention to the little things in your personal life. He talks about your character, verses 3 through 8. Pay attention. He talks about your relationship with other believers in verses 9 and 10. And then he talks about your relationship with everybody else, the world, right? The neighborhood where you live out there in Missouri City or over in Katy or wherever it might be. He talks about those three things. And there's not anything here that he's going to say to you this morning that you have not already heard. But I want you to hear the message this morning. Stay with it. Stay with it. Whatever it is that's going on out there, as intense as it may have been in Thessalonica, don't you, you stay with the small stuff. 
All right? He spends most of his time talking about personal character. So that's where we're going to spend most of our time in verses 3 through 8. Okay, y'all ready? Seatbelts buckled? Here he goes. Look at what he says in verse 3. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. Now, that's the, act, that's the truth. Put that on your, on your refrigerator, right? It is God's will that you be sanctified. What does God want from me? What does God want me to do? What's his will for my life? Here it is, bottom line. He wants you to be sanctified. What does that mean? Well, it means it is God's will for you to be a saint. How's that feeling? How many feel like you've already messed that up? What does that mean? Well, here it is. Here's another way of putting it. It is God's will that you be holy. What? What? Let me, let's just put it down. Here it is. It's God's will that you be different from people who don't believe in the God you believe in. Your life needs to reflect it. It's God's will that you be sanctified. Sanctified and saint come from the same root word. And sanctified is something that's used two ways in the New Testament. Y'all with me on this? It, it's something that happens to you at a point in time. The moment you become a Christian, boom, there you are. God says, sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. But it's also a process where we become more and more. We grow in sanctification. We grow in hope. Because all of us, whenever it was that you were converted... We're all, it's just kind of like, wow, you got a lot of stuff, a lot of baggage you're carrying. And so life is a process of becoming more and more sanctified. So here it is. I don't know that it's his will that you pass that test next week. I don't know that it's his will that you get that job promoted. I don't know that that's his will at all. But here's what I do know. It's his will that you become like him. Everybody has a God. Right? Everybody has a God. And here's what happens. Everybody worships their God. And you become like what you worship. That's the big thing about worship, coming together on a Sunday morning as believers. Because we're becoming more and more like Him. We become like what we worship. You worship money, you become more and more like that. Kind of cold, kind of hard, kind of bottom line. You worship sex, you become a certain kind of way. You worship pleasure, you become... You worship Jehovah God, you become sanctified. Right? You become holy, you become more and more like Him. So here's what He says. There it is. Put that on your icebox this week. It is God's will for Mark to be sanctified. What do you mean? He says, let me tell you, that you should avoid sexual immorality. By the way, he didn't say avoid sex. Okay? Sex is good. Sex is perfect. Sex is an intimate or a part of intimacy. Sex is beautiful. Sex draws people together. Sex is uh, about pleasure. Sex is about all kinds. Of, sex is something that God created for us to have. And on the day of creation, when all of that was done, what did he say? Not only is it good, he said, it's, it's really good. And I say, amen, God had that right, don't you? He doesn't say avoid sex. Y'all are not sure whether you ought to respond to that or not, are you? Huh? <laughs> He doesn't say avoid sex. He says you avoid immorality, the abuse of it, and living in ways that violate that core part of you that God put together to be beautiful, to be beautiful. Here's, and why does he pick on that? Well, because that's kind of a basic, fundamental sort of thing, isn't it? It's connected to our passions. It's connected to kind of our libido. It's not something we really sit down and really kind of always think through, Right? Your passions get stirred, and here's what happens. You don't really care what you know. You ever experienced that? Your passions get stirred, and you don't really care what you know. Boy, it can take you away in a heartbeat. So he says, look, sanctified life means this. You avoid immorality. What do you mean exactly? Verse 4, well, each of you should learn to control his own body. I don't think he's talking about a fastidious, obsessive, compulsive kind of look. That'll drive you nuts. You become like a centipede who tends again to think one day, how do I walk with a hundred legs? How do I? He, the more he thinks about it, the more he stumbles all over himself, right? But what he's talking about is you know who you are. You know what your limits are. You know what's out there. You know the world that you live in, right? And you bring yourself under control. Control yourself. By the way, it's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? Galatians chapter 5. You control your body in a way that is holy and honorable. Why? Because God is. Right? This is, look, this is fundamental, isn't it? This is foundation. You know what this is? This is a football. This is a football. 
Control yourself in a way that's honorable and holy, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God. Now, that sounds a little pejorative, okay? Uh, we're not going to have conversation about translations and what they all, how you arrive at different translations and what their uh, basic uh, assumptions are. But NIV, and I'm reading from an NIV, is, an, is a translation that really tries to hit the language of the culture, Right? And probably they ought to rethink that word heathen because when you hear that, it sounds pejorative and it sounds like Paul's talking down and he's talking about people that are not Christians as if they are sub something or other. That's the furthest thing from Paul's mind. All he's trying to do is say, we have a different God than people who don't know God. We have a different agenda. We have a different set of rules. All of it, it's, it's just, it's not, it's not, it's not the same. And that in this matter, verse 6, no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. Some people have speculated that there was a brother in the Thessalonican church that cheated with another man's wife, a brother's wife, committed adultery with her, or maybe had sex with one of the household slaves of those people in the upper, uh, upper social structure. I don't know. Maybe he's just talking, right? We don't do that. We don't act that way amongst each other, right? Don't take advantage of a brother that way. The Lord will, just as a reminder, the Lord will punish men for all such sins as we have already told you and warned you. Some things you don't just tell, you also warn about, right? For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but God, who gives you the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that gives us life. He says, man, listen, this is not some small thing. Now, here's the deal. In Thessalonica... For the people that were converted that were not already Jewish, there was no concept that anything that, about immoral sex. It just wasn't there. And it's a whole lot like the culture that we're in right now. Right? Is, that why he, is that why he hits that so hard? Well, that's part of it. But it's also because we are fallen people and we got something inside of us that's the bulkhead of sin. It's our fallen nature. And as I said a minute ago, you can get to the point, arousal or passions going, you don't care what you know. See. And you know what it's like Paul is saying right here? You know what he's saying, really? He's saying, do not underestimate your potential to be sorted. Don't think you're all that. I don't care whether you're 90 or 19. You're not all that. Watch out. I, you know, and I've said this to you before. It's my favorite Carl Sandburg quote. You know what I thought of this morning? I've said this, this quote to you several times. I don't even know anything that Carl Sandburg wrote. I, I know this quote. I, and, I, and maybe, I, you know, except that poem that he did that time about Frost is on the pump. Or was that Walt Whitman? Frost is on the pump. Do y'all know what? Don't look at me like that. Do y'all know? So y'all don't know either, okay? But here's what Carl Sandburg said, this poet, this novel writer. He said, there is within me an eagle that wants to soar. Remember me talking about it? But there's also a hippopotamus that wants to wallow in the mud. There we are. There we are. Never underestimate your potential to be sorted. I'm talking to me more than I am to anybody else in here. I'll guarantee you. And part of it, listen, don't underestimate the host culture that you're in. We can't live in this culture and not be tainted, not be touched not be pulled. It just can't happen. As it was in Thessalonica, that's the way it is right here. And let me tell you, that's when you got to know. You got to understand. By the way, you got to understand your ability to self-justify. Or am I the only one that does that? (laughs) It's written all over your face. Yeah, we do that. You know why we do that? Because we can't live with a conflict inside. We know here's the way we ought to be, but here's what we do, or here's what we did, or here's our, our tendency. And so what happens along the way, you feel really guilty at times. By the way, let's don't underestimate the grace of God, right? And his repentance, that's there. I'm just not talking about, Paul's not talking about that right now. He's talking about the direction of your life, right? So, 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 so there it is. And so we tend to justify. There's a book out there. Let me tell you about this book. The title, let's tell you the title anyway. The title is Mistakes Were Made, and then in parentheses, all in lower caps, but not by me. You love that book? How could you not pick that book up and buy it? Mistakes Were Made, all capital letters, and then in parentheses, but not by me. Okay, and it talks about, there's two authors. I don't remember their names. You don't care anyway. 
But they develop the case that this inner thing that goes on inside of us to justify ourselves is stronger and more deceptive than any intentional, overt lie that you would ever tell. And that's not whether you're talking about immorality, you're talking, whatever it is you're talking about, whatever it is. We begin and we start that first level where you kind of come back and say, well, man, I didn't really have a choice in that matter. And then it kind of becomes of, well, that's the best thing I could do in that situation. And then it becomes, really, it was brilliant what I did there because there was nothing else that could be done. It goes through all those kinds of stages. There's another part of the book, and I may have told you guys about this before, where they talk about studies that are done between husbands and wives. Have I told you all about that? Where they ask each of them, what percentage of the housework do you do? Did I tell you all about that? Yeah, I did tell you about that, right? No? Yeah? Okay, well, forget that part then. So, no, look, let me tell you, just in case you missed that. They, they, you ask them, how many, what percentage of housework do you do? And the numbers may be a little bit different, but they always come up over 100%. I started to do a deal where for everybody sitting with their mates, for y'all to ask each other that question this morning, but I didn't want us to break out in a brawl, all right? So I didn't, I didn't ask that. But it generally comes out where it's always over 100%. Why is that? Is somebody a liar? Are one of you guys absolutely lying? About? Well, no, it's just that tendency we have to justify where we are and make ourselves look better maybe than what it really is. Do not underestimate your potential to do that. And in the process of that, not see what's going on around you. Not have a feel for that. Right? Know your limits. A preaching colleague of mine, his name is John Ortberg. He, and his, he lives out in California, kind of a weird place sometimes. And he's walking along. He's, he, them and some, he and his wife and another couple they're friends with, they're going on this street fair. And they're kind of going down the way. And there's a guy there with a mechanical bull. How many of you, everybody here knows about a mechanical bull, right? Okay. Gillies. What? Gillies. Yeah, that's right. That's right. How many of you have ever ridden a mechanical bull? Put your hands in the air. <laughs> Y'all are nuts. Okay, let me tell you about this. He's watching what's going on with this mechanical bull. And uh, he's kind of looking at it. And the guy that's standing there operating the bull, he says, hey, it's a lot more fun to ride than it is to just look. Do you guys understand the male ego? That was like saying, oh, I can't believe he just said that to me. He watched it a little bit longer. And he decided, I'm going to ride that bull. So he tells the guy, he said, I'm, I'm, I, want to, I want to go, I want to ride this bull. And the guy that had said that to him in the, fir in the first place said, he looked one look at his middle-aged body, and he says, are you sure? Whew. That's like sick him, okay? So now John is absolutely committed. He's going to ride this thing. All right. So he gets on, and the guy explains to him, he says, now there's 12 levels that get more difficult as you go along. He said, here's the thing that you do. You've got to remember, stay centered on the bull. Don't try to kill yourself hanging on. You just stay centered on that bull, and you'll come out better. So John gets on. He said, first it started out kind of slow, and then, man, I mean, they were rocking. And he found himself really hanging on, and he's just about to lose it, and then he remembered what the guy had said. So he just kind of let himself be loose. Do I look, you know, you know how come I look so good doing this? Because I used to ride real bulls. Have I ever told you all that in high school? I know about this stuff. you got to stay low and slow. Here you go. <laughs> so that's what he did. And he said, he said it was intense. He said, but then it began to slow down, and he didn't fall off. He said, part of the time I was hanging on sideways. He said, it was not pretty. It was not pretty, but I did it. And he said, when, it was all, when the thing stopped, here's the way guys are. Whether they show it on the outside or not, there's a kind of a smirk on the inside, like a So he's doing that, and he wants the guy that's doing the bull thing to know that. So he looks at him, and that guy looks at him. Their eyes meet, and the guy that ran the bull said, he just he said, you did good. He smiled and said, you did good. He said, that was level one. <laughs> Where's your level one? You've got to know yourself. You've got to know what's going on around you. You've got to know the culture that you're in or you're going to go down. You think you can handle it? You don't, I'm going to say it again. You don't care what you know when passions get stirred to a certain point. You've got to know where you are. Because listen, every choice you make, take this to the bank. It's not original with me. It's original with C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity. If you've never read that, buy it, read it. It's a good book. Josh, my son has read that. Haven't you read that book, Josh? Mere Christianity? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't give me that blank look. I've seen that all my life. Did y'all see that just now? <laughs> yeah. 
Here's what he says. There's a part of you, it's this central thing in you. Um, It's a place where worship takes place. It's a place where values are held. And it's a place where you make decisions. It's a central thing. He says, every time you make a decision, that central thing is different. It's changed from what it was before you made the decision. Good, bad, or indifferent. It changes. And on any given little short span, it's no big thing, right? You don't really see it. But over the span of your entire life, you find yourself moving in a direction. You're either becoming more like heaven or you're becoming more like hell. And on the one hand, as you become more like heaven, you're coming to peace with God and to peace with your fellow man and to peace inside of yourself. And in the other way, it's a battleground between you and God, between you and people, and between you and yourself. On the one hand, you're going toward love and joy and peace and gentleness and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and self-control. But the other way is a pathway of horror and idiocy and rage and ultimately loneliness. Watch those decisions. Y'all hear what I'm saying? I'm not teasing about it, right? Look at Paul again in verses 3 through 8. Okay, I'm out of time, but I'm going to do this real quick, okay? More quickly than I was going to do it, okay? That's your personal character. Second thing he talks about, pay attention to, is your relationship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Look at what he says in verses 9 and 10. He says in verses 9, Now about brotherly love, we don't need to write you because you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. Man, I mean, we know that, right? I mean, you talk about the, listen, little, this is fundamentals. What's he saying? This is a football, y'all. Love each other, you know that. And in fact, you do love all the brothers throughout Macedonia. The fact of the matter is, it's not just within your congregation, but believers everywhere where they're exactly where you are. They think a little differently than you do or, or whatever it might be. You love the brother, you love followers of Jesus in a brotherly way. That's our family, see, that's our kin. So he says, I was going to do this faster, but. Oh, oh, my mistake. Look at the rest of that verse. Look at the rest of verse 10. Here you go. As you do love all the brothers of Macedonia, yet we urge you, brothers, to do so more and more. Stay with the small. Stay with that fundamental stuff. Stay with it. Stay with it. Stay with it. And then he talks about your relationship with everybody around you. That's verses 12 and 13. Make it your ambition, he says, to lead a quiet life, to mind your own cotton picking. He didn't say cotton picking. Mind your own business and to work with your hands just as we told you. And here it comes. Here it is. Why? So that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders. And so you won't be dependent upon anybody. Three things. Lead a quiet life. He doesn't mean that you're doing this, you know, you you know, and you're just so, okay. he's not talking about personalities. He's not talking, what he's talking about is to the folks that are around you. He's not talking about believers, your fellow believers. He's talking about the world around you. Don't be intrusive. Don't burden them with your, you, 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 don't, don't do that. And mind your own business. In English, that is a kind of an idiom, right? But it was also in the Greek. It meant basically the same thing. Get your nose out of their business. Mind your own business. That's harder for some of us than it is for others, right? Mind your own business and get a job. Work. Work. Do what it takes that you're not a burden to the, to the neighborhood, right? He's, again, I'm not talking about believers, fellow believers. What he's talking about is how we relate to each other. He's talking about your relationship with the world, with the world around you. Basic, fundamental, foundational stuff. Paul, what do you say? Paul says, I say, this is a football. This is a football. Stay with the little stuff. Make it your ambition. I need to quit right now. Can you give me just two more minutes? Is that okay? What are you going to say? No? (laughs) Just give me. No, you know what? I'll do this another time. Never mind. There it is. How can we serve you this morning? Jesus Christ has paid it all. My brother Shane opened up that door for us as we were participating in the Lord's Supper this morning. How can we serve you? If you have something you want to share with this body, I'm going to ask our elders and their wives to go out across the back. Uh, I'll be here at the front. Uh, let's let Jesus know as we stand and sing.
to my own life. I need you more, more than yesterday. I need you more, more than words can say. Before you're dismissed, before short conversations, the door, the engines hiss, before Sunday lunch, Sunday nap, Sunday that, Sunday this, before your errands and plans and inevitable to-do list, before you wake up tomorrow just to forget whatever you promised, whatever God taught us, whatever you've jotted down on your journal, phone, or wrist, before you're dismissed, I just want to say that Christianity is not what you've done here today. This was half a percent of your week. 168 hours minus 56 for sleep. 112 to be alive. And this one that's now complete is supposed to spread like yeast to make leaven the loaf of the other 111? Which begs the question, are you trying to do in one day what God has meant for seven? So before you're dismissed, be reminded of this. Church is not only what you've just experienced, but exists in a life outside these walls that hears the words of Christ and answers their calls. So before you go about your other 111, remember that only when you leave the church building can you create the kingdom.